Hi, this is Jonesy with Jetters Northwest and welcome to the Brute Hydro Jetter training session. In this video, we'll get you acclimated to your new Brute Jetter, go through operations, go through the nozzles, and of course, cover a little bit of maintenance and safety and get you set up to get started. Now this video will cover operations and maintenance for really all types of the, what we call the second generation Brute Jetter, which came out in 2016. You can see this is a four wheel cart model. This is a mountable skid model. Uh, this is a 12 gallon a minute 3000, or we call it a 3012. This is a nine gallon a minute 4000 PSI. Uh, both of these are gasoline engine units. You might have a propane unit that is uh, something like eight and a half gallons a minute 3500 PSI or one of the alternate specs. Um, this one has wireless remote control. This one does not. Uh, this one has an adjustable speed motorized hose reel. This one has a simple hand crank. Uh, my point is that the training will cover both. Um, and one thing to cover is if you've purchased a skid, notice that it is totally convertible to the four wheel cart type. Or if you purchased a four wheel cart, it is totally convertible to skid. They are really inherently the same design, same frame, same machine. So right off the bat, uh, we're going to do most of the work really today with the skid because it has a lot of the features, the, the options that some of you have purchased. But definitely want to get in the picture of the hand crank uh, four wheel cart basic unit. On the wireless remote units, you will not have this throttle control on the panel. So if you did not get wireless, you'll be using the throttle here. So I want to make a point of that before we get started. But from here on out, we're pretty much going to work with the full featured machine. All right, right off the bat, let's get you acclimated with the control center of your Brute Jetter. Of course, up on top, we have the hose reel and the hose reel controls. We'll come back to that. Let's start over here on the left. This is what we call the flow control valve. You might call it the jetting on-off valve. Uh, right now, it's in the down position. That is what we call the safety position in that when the jetter is running, in fact, as soon as you start the engine, the pump is pumping and this valve in the down position is basically sending all the water that the pump is pumping back to your water tank. Okay, so the water is never completely cut off like a, say, a pressure washer would when you let go of the trigger. No, we're just literally dumping the water flow and pressure. So naturally, to start jetting, you just raise this up toward the hose and reel and that directs the water from the pump through the hose and ultimately to the jetting nozzle. So, jetting on, jetting off. And you can see it's marked here, flow on, flow off. So flow control, jetting control, same thing. Uh, moving over, this is your pressure regulator. This is a pressure regulating unloader valve. So what this does is if the pressure gets up above whatever this is set for and out of the factory from here, it's going to be pretty much typically set for maximum. This machine is 3000 PSI maximum, so the regulator is set for that. Um, if you wanted to run, say you're cleaning an orange bird or a soft pipe and you wanted to do 2000 PSI max no matter what, on a sensitive pipe you could back it off. And what this will do, no matter what you throttle up to, if the pressure comes up to, say, 2000 where you had it set, it's going to divert water back to the water tank. Okay, so a point being, if you want to adjust pressure, don't do it with this valve. This is for jetting on, jetting off. This is where you can fine tune in your pressure with the pressure regulating unloader valve. Okay, next, let's move along to the rest of the control panel. Here is your pressure gauge, of course. Uh, you'll see it reads all the way up to five or 6,000 PSI, depending on your model. Uh, know this, just because the gauge says five or 6,000 PSI does not mean that the jetter can go that high. Um, gauges like you to be in the mid-range so here we're operating at 3,000 PSI maximum. So that's right in the middle of this 6,000 PSI gauge. You might have uh, the 4009 model, which of course would run at 4,000. Again, we're kind of in that mid range. Uh, point here is when you see this number up here, 3,000 PSI maximum for this being the 3012 model or 4,000 PSI maximum on your 4009, or if you have a propane that is 3,500 this is here in plain sight, so you'll know that is the machine's maximum, okay? The pump might be able to drive up higher than that, and you can get in and play with the unloader and adjust uh, its range and start driving up higher than that. We do not recommend that. That will take you out of warranty because even though the pump might pump it, it will be bogging down the engine 
into an uncomfortable position for it and it's going to wear out early. Okay, so there's a reason for this maximum and we need you to adhere to that no matter what you can adjust up to. Okay, um, moving over here we have the pulsation control. Uh, what is pulsation? Pulsation is a valve that uh, takes the pump a little bit out of sequence for the purpose of making your hose shake. Uh, simply put, this is to help you or help your nozzle pull your hose deeper and deeper into the pipe. Um, you know, as the nozzle's pulling the hose along, it's just dragging on the bottom of the pipe. Well, as you make the hose shake, it helps it hop along to get through elbows um, and work its way up the pipe. Uh, also, a big one, the pulse can help you get unstuck. So as you're pulling back, if your nozzle catches an edge, say like an offset joint or something, and it just doesn't want to come back to you, uh, just crack this open go back forward and a lot of times it will hop right over that edge and just keep coming right back out. So those are the reasons for pulsation. Um, one myth out there is that the pulse helps you jet better. You'll hear things like pulse hammer action and it's just not correct. Um, you'll see actually that when you open up the pulse, the more you open it, the more your pressure drops off because what it does is it takes one of the pump cylinders out of sequence. It's actually lowering your GPM and your PSI. So when you don't need to get unstuck or you don't need your hose to uh, doesn't need a little help with the pulse turn it off your jetter will have more flow have more pressure and it's going to be a lot smoother this is not a healthy thing to have on all the time the pulsation so normally it's off as i've got it turned off there Moving over to the engine controls. You see we've got a key start here. If you're going to run wireless control, you don't even need that. Okay. In fact, I recommend you just don't even put it in. Wireless control, the key start, so to speak, is right on here. We'll come back to that. We're going to start with manual operation. When I say manual, it means not remote. So we turn our key to the on position. You heard that sound. That's the uh, fuel injectors loading. And that was also, for a wireless remote model, it's opening up the jetting valve in the back. Um, now we've moved there, we can turn the key and start. I won't do that for sake of noise. Just like you're starting your car, um, it's a fuel-injected engine. You don't have to pull a choke or anything like that. It can start dead cold, uh, even with the wireless remote control. Or if you've got a propane model, that's a pressurized fuel system also. So again, no choke. Uh, on your manual jitter, if you do not have wireless control, like we showed you a moment ago, for throttling, you're going to have a lever arm here. Throttle up, throttle down. Um, on a wireless remote model, when you're running in manual mode, okay, not with the remote, you're going to be throttling up and down with this toggle switch. Each touch is going to give you a few hundred RPM. If you just hold it down, it's going to max out at full throttle and you can't really go over. Okay. And then you can just hold it down to go down to idle if you wish. Pretty straightforward. Now controlling pressure, we mentioned a moment ago that we have a pressure regulator here, but if you're running on the main jetter hose with a nozzle right on the end, and you're not running, say, a mini hose, uh, you pretty much can control your throttle, or control your pressure, excuse me, with your throttle up down. Because as you throttle up, you're bringing more water to the nozzle. The nozzle is the main point of resistance that creates pressure. So the more water we put up against that nozzle, the higher the pressure becomes. So very simply, the easiest way to adjust pressure is with your throttle. Throttle up for more pressure, which at the same time is more flow. Throttle down for less pressure, less flow. And um, just to make the point on the gallons per minute, when you turn the jetter on, it just doesn't suddenly create, in this case, 12 gallons at 3,000 PSI. It builds it up. So you, when you go to full throttle, full throttle is full gallons per minute. Half throttle is half gallons a minute, right? Zero throttle is no gallons a minute. It's off, okay? So as you're raising flow, you're raising pressure at the same time, okay? It's not a compressor. You don't turn it on and it builds up a bunch of pressure and you stick it in the line and release it. No, uh, it's a hydraulic system. So it builds pressure based on pushing flow to the resistance of the jetting nozzle. Now, for those of you that have wireless remote control, Let's talk about controlling the throttle and everything with that. 
So the first thing I need to do is I'm going to take the key out so nobody gets confused and tries to turn the key on and off. I'm just going to get it out of the play. And I need to next turn my remote switch on. You hear that valve in the back? That's the wirelessly controlled jetting valve getting set in the safety position. Back over here for a moment. When we take this valve and have it down, we call that the safety position. But if I'm going to jet wirelessly, the machine automatically put the secondary valve in safety. So now I bring this one all the way up so I can control my jetting right here. Here we have a close up of your wireless remote control. Now starting at the bottom, the engine on switch, as I push that, you can hear the fuel injector load up. This is like turning your key to the on position, but not quite turning it to start. To start, we would push this button. I'm not gonna go ahead and run it but you have to hold it down till it starts, of course. Now, as we want to throttle up and down, there's down, which moves the throttle arm. There's the turtle, and then the rabbit or the hare, just throttle up. And you can just touch it, touch it, touch it, or you can hold them down, just like we did with the toggle switch on the panel. Up here, here's your pressure on and off, or you can call it your jetting on and off. As I push that, you can hear the jetting control valve moving to let's call it the on position or the pressure up and I push it again and it opens up and dumps the water back to the tank to delete the pressure and at that point turn it back on I'd be loading up and starting to jet the line I throttle up here to bring my pressure up again bring the pressure down here and then when I'm done I go pressure off and then hit the kill button now, if I am running, let's go ahead and just run for a moment. I can kill very quickly, just like that. So you can call this button also your safety kill. No matter what's happening, you can always push this button and turn everything off. Now, for machines like this one that has an adjustable speed controlled electric motor hose reel, then I can push the hose reel button and you can hear it engage there. And that will wind the reel whichever direction that the main control is set for. And we'll show you that here in another scene coming up. Okay, now we've shown you the remote control. When you're done jetting, or if you're gonna go back to manual control with the key, you want to turn the remote system off, and that also will keep it so there's no draw on the battery. And you know, say you've got it set aside for an overnight or you haven't jetted for a week, we wanna make sure this is off. We also, for safety's sake, wanna take our main jetting control valve, flow control valve, back down to the safety position. And it's been very important with this valve to make sure it's all the way down or when you're jetting it's all the way up. People wear these out prematurely by leaving say about 90% up and it's weeping water past the seats in the valve at high velocity which wears it out quickly. So when you're jetting this goes all the way up. When you're not jetting it goes all the way down. Moving back direction, um, we have our line strainer. Uh, most jetters have this somewhere in the middle. You have to go find where to clean the line strainer or the filter. This is where the, uh, the water from the water tank is being filtered out so it's clean enough to go through the water pump. And I'm just going to show you right now. It's really simple to take off. I'm going to go to the back and I'm going to close off the valve, which we'll show you in an upcoming scene so that I won't empty out the water tank. I'll get some water out of here, but not a lot. Okay, cleaning your strainer is something you should do every day. Um, if you do it every week, you'll be farther ahead of many, many, many people that own jetters because it is one of the easiest things to service and one of the most ignored. So I really want to stress this, and we've done this in other videos. You see the strainer can has this filter in here. It's technically a strainer screen. And there's some debris in there. Those are shavings out of the tank when we did uh, drill the holes in the tank. So we want to make sure that's clear. If you see little pieces in there, you can take them out with your fingers. You can take uh, it to just a water source and just run water through it. You can open up the water here and rinse it out. Main point is make sure it's clean, okay? 
and also the bowl. You don't want to accidentally drop some fragments that you cleaned out of here inside the bowl because now they're past the screen and they're going to go straight to the pump. And then lastly, there's an O-ring seal here. You want to make sure this O-ring is in good condition. Um, might give it a little Vaseline every once in a while. And if it looks flat, it looks worn out, just replace it. It's a simple O-ring. Putting the strainer back together, you just press it in so it doesn't want to fall out. Thread it backwards till you feel it fall into place and just tighten it up hand tight. It will typically prime, but I like to leave it a little bit cracked. Open the valve up in the back and now it's priming itself. Again, just tighten it up hand tight and now you're ready to jet again. This is your exhaust extension. So naturally the engine would just exhaust out the side and most people, especially for a skid unit, but even with carts, like to load these up against a wall or a bulkhead and we need to direct this exhaust out the door. So that's what this is for. It's also insulated, so you do want to leave a few inches of space between this exhaust and any kind of wall or bulkhead, okay? If you've got sensitive materials right here, there is going to be heat here, and especially down here where the exhaust comes out, anything around here could get hot. Okay, taking a side view of your Brute Jetter, uh, if you have a gasoline-powered model up on top, you're going to have a small tool bin. That'll be where you'll find your nozzles and your nozzle extension and your manual. Okay, down here we've got oils to be concerned with. Right here is the pump oil level. And it should be at least up to that red dot. Um, it should also look kind of golden or clear. If it starts to look gray or milky, uh, it's probably time to replace the high-pressure seals in your pump. And that's... Usually a few, several hundred hours down the road, but it's something to keep your eyes on, not just the level, but how that looks. And by the way, this is like 30 weight non-detergent, not motor oil, it's like a hydraulic oil, lubricating oil. Um, this is 8090 gear oil, and the level is checked on the other side, we'll get to that. And your engine is using a typical 10W30 or 10W40. Here's your fill point, this is a Honda IGX 800 engine. And this is the dipstick, they're gray. If you have our Kohler uh, CH749 engine or the propane, these are going to be yellow. And the oil filter on this model is over on the other side. So typical dipstick here, you would just lift out and check your oil levels. Should be up close to this top dot. You can see the oil is real clean and clear. Oil should always look nice and clean. If it starts to be dark at all, you're probably well overdue for changing your oil. Um, Oil change interval. Uh, the break-in is at about, if you're anywhere in that 30, 50, 30, 40, 50 hour range, it's time to change all three oils, engine, pump, and the transmission gearbox. Uh, and also change your oil filter on your engine. After that, it goes quite a ways. Uh, it's about 100 hours or so for your next oil change on your engine. And you typically do not change the filter on the second change. You change it every other, the filter, the oil filter. Uh, and the pump in the gearbox can go like 300 hours. So these kind of things, you can watch your hour meter, certainly. I recommend you at least put them on some sort of calendar schedule. If you're jetting regularly, you might change your engine oil every quarter, and then, say, twice a year at the time change, change your pump oil, your gearbox oil, and your oil filter in the least. It's good to put them on a calendar and get those maintenances taken care of. Um, speaking of other lubrications, there aren't really too many. Uh, this is what we call the hose reel swivel up here. This allows, of course, the hose reel to turn while still receiving pressure. Um, you wanna hit this with a, a simple spray lube every once in a while. Um, you might have a model that has a grease stick that takes a grease shot from a grease gun. Uh, most of the ones we're doing nowadays, though, just take a shot of some simple WD-40 or something to keep the seals in there lubricated. You can uncouple that quick disconnect like I showed you and just spray it right down in it and then just spin around circles, and that gives that a nice lube for you. Okay, over here on the other side of the brute jetter, let me point a few more things out for you. Uh, number one, here's that oil filter. Again, on the Honda, it's blue. If you have a Kohler, it's going to be yellow. And this is your high pressure pump. But lastly, here is the oil level for the gearbox transmission. And again, it should be about halfway up. So uh, the newer models now have a plug here 
where you just fill it until you see oil kind of spill out and then you put the plug back in. Uh, this should not consume oil, right? So as you go through your oil change intervals, you'll just be changing out that gear oil. So if you don't see a sight glass, don't be alarmed. The newer models, the brand new ones, have simply a plug here. But if you do see oil spilling out off the top of the gearbox, it just simply means that you overfilled it. It will spit out what it does not want. Okay, next let's talk about your hose reel. We really have three types of hose reel. We have an H model that has the hand crank, which we showed you earlier. We have an E model that has a push button down here that winds it up quickly at one speed. And then we have this one, which is an ES model, which is electric reel for the E, and S means speed control, adjustable speed. We'll come back to that because right now it all starts with the lock and unlock feature. Whether you've got a hand crank or you've got an electric powered reel, if you want that reel to move, you've got to unlock it. So we pull this pin back and set it. Now the reel has freedom to move. Now, why would you want to lock it? Well, a lot of guys like to lock it when they're driving down the road, but mainly if you're using your wireless remote control to start and stop the jetting, or if you're indoors with like a foot pedal or uh, a ball valve control, hand trigger, whatever it might be, every time you go jetting on, jetting off, if you don't have this reel locked, your reel is probably going to walk back and forth, jetting on, jetting off, jetting on, jetting off, or foot pedal on, foot pedal off. And when you come back out, you'll often find this hose kind of balled up here. So if we lock the reel, it solves that problem. Now we go jetting on, jetting off, the reel will just wiggle a little bit and we won't have our hose balling up and becoming a mess. Okay, for those of you that have a motorized hose reel on your brute jetter, let's talk about controlling that. Uh, this is the ES model. So it is electric rewind hose reel with speed control. Uh, if you have this particular model, you can choose whether to have the hose unwind when you push the button or more typically wind up when you push the button. So as I pull some hose out, when I push the button, it simply winds up, okay? And on your wireless remote control, the button here just replaces this button. So when I push the real button, it's just like I push this button here. If it's on unwind, when I push the button, on the remote, it's going to unwind, okay? So, you always want to set this, if you're going to wind remotely, set it for the position you want it. You also, of course, can adjust the speed, as I said. So if I turn it all the way to slow, it actually does nothing until I give it a little bit of speed and then I can adjust the speed there. Pretty straightforward. Now, for those of you who have an E model, which does not have speed control, and that is the most common, you won't have these two controls. You'll simply have a push button and it's going to wind up. It will not have an unwind feature and it's pretty easy to pull the hose off and manually unwind it. So that's why that's pretty popular. Um, typically this button will be down here on the reel frame. And you'll just push the button and you get a fast wind up. Um, and if you're wondering what's the reason for one or the other, if you typically just jet away from the jetter and you just want to wind it up quickly when you're done, that's why a lot of guys just get the single speed E model. But if there's ever a time you want to rewind the hose while you're jetting, you want to be able to speed control because the plan with jetting is often, especially going like manhole to manhole or between catch basins, or even into a clean out, what I call direct jetting, where your jetter is right there up near the entry point. Um, you want to go out quickly with your hose and rewind slowly so it can scour and clean. That's the reason primarily for speed control. Now lastly with the hose reel, this unit also has the upgrade of a four roller hose guide. So you can see I have one, two, three, four rollers. And this is really for hose containment. Um, it also pivots outward, uh, which is nice for most typically coming out of a van. Say my van is parked curbside, but I need to bring my hose that way. Well, I can bring this out, which typically gets it outside of the door. And then when I take my hose and pull it, now I've got a guide to pull against, right? And then when I come back, when I'm done, I can just push it back up and out of the way. Uh, now you might have a pivoting guide, which is on all of our trailers. 
Every once in a while, a guy, uh, customer will order a brute and want a pivoting hose guide. So that will be just down here. You won't have the full roller, but you're able to pivot back and forth. And again, that's nice for one, like I just talked about direct jetting, where you're rewinding the hose while you're jetting. You can guide the hose onto your hose reel evenly. But otherwise, you're typically doing that with your gloved hand as you're winding up the reel. You're just guiding it along to fill your hose reel properly. Let's talk about the back side of your brute jetter and how to bring water to it. Uh, number one, we have a garden hose inlet right here and we can see a little strainer in there. So we simply can use a garden hose and feed this, we call the buffer tank. Now this has a float valve in it, just like a toilet tank, when it's full, it's going to shut off. So you don't have to worry about babying the water level on this. It's not a water supply tank, it's a buffer. What do we mean by that? Well, like this is a 12 gallon a minute jetter, or again, you might have the nine gallon a minute model. Um, that's a lot of water. This is uh, a 12 gallon tank. The float valve shuts it off at about the 10 gallon level. So if you think about it, if you have a nine or 12 gallon a minute jetter, you're pretty much emptying this in a minute, okay? So you're always feeding it with water. So here we have a garden hose. I'm using a nice big three quarter inch garden hose, which we highly recommend. Stay away from little five eighths hoses. And by the way, this is also an industrial rubber hose, so even if it gets dead kinked, it remembers right back. Highly recommend more of a commercial industrial rubber water hose. Uh, one thing I don't recommend is like this one has been dragged and beaten up and the threads are kind of beat up. So it's a little hard to thread in there. I have to really kind of tighten it. So don't allow your jet, uh, garden hose to be dragged around. It will beat up those threads. I'm not even gonna tighten it all the way up. So here again, I seal this up, and if this is inside your van, you might want to snug this with a wrench. Garden hose gaskets do wear out. Keep some extra garden hose gaskets with you um, so it doesn't drip all over your, your van. Now at this point, we cut the water on, the tank will fill up, the float valve will shut it off, and now it works as a buffer, this tank does, so that if you're jetting along, you're consuming, say, 12 gallons a minute. If your water supply is only giving you, say, like eight, it's going to draw down a bit. We have other videos to talk about that, um, what we call tank drawdown. Um, so if you run out of water, you can just pause your jetting, especially easy with a wireless remote, just kill and let it catch up real quick. And then you can start over again. That's why we call it a buffer tank. Okay, for those of you that have an auxiliary water tank, whether you bought it from us or you've provided your own water auxiliary water tank, we've got to make some changes so you can draw water from that other tank. So obviously I've taken the garden hose off. We're not using that. So let's go down here. This plug right here is the auxiliary inlet. So first thing you'll do is take that off and that provides you inch and a quarter threads. Now, I'm not gonna get into those connections right now. That's an extensive video, but we've got a link below for you on making a connection to an auxiliary water tank. In fact, we've got a couple of videos. One covers our Brute 60 gallon portable tank, which has cam couplers. Um, and then there's the uh, one covering our skid mount tanks for our van packages. And uh, you can use that as a guideline also if you provided your own water tank. I will say this, though, this is inch and a quarter. And for larger tanks, you want to step that up at least one size. Like in our videos, we step it up to inch and a half. But on the in-between, we've got to make a change here. And this is covered in the other video, but I'm going to cover it real quickly. If we're not drying from this tank, we need to cut it off and cut it out of the system. So we're just picturing we've got a hose or pipe connected here from our larger auxiliary water tank. We're gonna close this valve to cut this tank off because we can't draw from this tank and another tank at the same time unless they're at the same level. Well, just don't. So we take this knife valve, cut it off. Now this tank is out of play and we're drawing water from your auxiliary tank. Next, we want to return water. This connection is the return line. We don't wanna return water to this tank when we're drawing water from a tank over here, right? So all we have to do is grab this yellow handle for this valve and point it toward the auxiliary tank. Now this bypass, and this will be quick connected or connected with a return hose. Now we're returning hose to that tank and drawing water from the auxiliary tank, creating that nice bypass loop that we talk about when the machine is running, 
but it's not jetting. Now another purpose for this tank is as an antifreeze reservoir. In fact, um, for those of you that are using a larger tank, an auxiliary water tank for water, no reason not to have this just be an antifreeze reservoir if you're in any situation where you think that the jetter might go below freezing. Uh, for that, we already have it, the valves in the right position. We can just fill this tank up with antifreeze. Uh, we recommend like a uh, a minus 30 or so windshield washer fluid or a RV antifreeze that uh, can get down to very low, low uh, temperature ranges. Not like a glycol that goes in an engine. That's, well, environmentally, we're supposed to uh, uh, recommend that you stay away from those. Use windshield washer fluid or an RV antifreeze. And for that situation, which we'll cover in another video, but we'll just show you again, we need to pull this valve out to allow the antifreeze to come into the system. I'm sure you'll have a valve on your line going to your auxiliary water tank that you'll cut off, otherwise all this antifreeze is just gonna go right into your auxiliary tank. That's the problem. Typically you would drain your auxiliary tank and then close the valve off, open this up, and now antifreeze can go in. If you want it to recirculate to your auxiliary tank some antifreeze just to freeze protect this bypass line, then you would leave this in this position and it'll just run for a, you know, a few seconds to purge antifreeze in that line. Or you can just put this in the opposite position like we talked about a moment ago and we'll recirculate the antifreeze to the antifreeze tank. Okay, before we jet live, we need to talk about nozzles. Uh, with every Brute Jetter or any of our Eagle trailer jetters, the standard nozzle set is a four nozzle set. So here it is, we get rid of the cardboard cover and we have in the case the four different standard nozzles. First is the penetrator nozzle. This is the most commonly used all-purpose nozzle. It has one jet going forward. When we say forward, we mean away from the hose, forward into the pipe and then four jets spraying back to provide thrust and back flushing. It's your most common multi-purpose head. Um, then we have the flusher nozzle, which does not have a forward jet, but it has a lot of thrust. So you can actually punch through plugs, clogs, often just blunt force. But it has wide angle jets, hence the name flusher for back flushing. If you're going in manhole to manhole or catch basin to catch basin and just want a flush line, you're going upstream from the clean out, it's a great nozzle for that because you get that wonderful back flushing and a lot of thrust to get up the line. It's the highest thrust nozzle of the bunch. Uh, the opposite of that is the pusher nozzle. The pusher nozzle has six rear jets to propel it forward and do some back flushing, but called a pusher because it has three forward jets blasting out ahead of it. And that might sound wonderful for like doing everything, especially of course when you're jetting, we call service jetting where you're jetting up uh, downstream from the building, going into a clean out in the building, trying to go toward the street. But you'll find that a pusher nozzle does not thrust really well because it has so much water coming out the front. This is why we give you a variety. But it's the pusher because it has that ability to blast out in front of it. And last of the four nozzles in the four nozzle set is a high speed spinning nozzle. This center barrel spins extremely fast with two wide angle jets. It pulls really nicely. And the main purpose for this is your soft grease, uh, sludge, septic sludge is one, um, where giving you that 360 degree cleaning coverage and not quote unquote drawing lines like some of these nozzles can, giving that full scour. And you might even call it a polishing sound, um, nozzle. Has a high wine, high pitched wine when you're running it which is often impressive to the customer as a final finish clean. And lastly in here, we have a orifice cleaner. These holes will plug up. The holes are called orifices. And you can use this tool to push out of them if there's like a teeny little pebble or something in there. Okay, about 80% uh, of y'all that buy a Jetta from us also buy one of the premium nozzles. Uh, here we have the Reaper and the Warthog. And 
just to show you what they look like and the size they are so you're identifying them when you unpack the items that come with your jetter. Um, and if you're not familiar with these, the Reaper has a forward cutting cone. These are both really great for cutting roots and cutting out the hard grease that the other nozzles just can't do. Um, the Reaper has a forward cone, which, well, you see the videos, can cut right through a piece of plywood, cut through a board. Um, obviously, you can cut through roots. It's a wonderful forward first attack nozzle for going after blockages. It's wonderful for using when you're working downstream, you're ending from the building and trying to push stuff away from you. It, this cone of water will push debris toward the street. And um, also just for pushing debris. Say you uh, use a flex shaft and you drop a lot of scale on the line, you want to flush it out, Reaper's wonderful for that. Um, the back jets are static, they just propel it and they do some back flushing as well. If you're not familiar with the Warthog, the whole head rotates with two rotating rear jets and an offset rotating front jet. Um, very sharp water jets, so it's giving the pipe an intense scour. Whether it's getting past grease, hardened grease, scale, roots, um, or you're just cleaning a large, say, a larger line, like an 8-inch, it really scours that pipe. And it does have the forward jet to do penetrating and coring as well. Now, if you have a 3 8 hose in your jetter, these nozzles will screw right on the end of the hose. If you have a half-inch hose, such as this one, that's why we provided for you this adapter hose. So it's got 3 8 on one end and it's got half inch on the other end. So you can bring that half inch hose and adapt it to the 3 8 nozzles. We like to use the 3 8 nozzles. Um, there is, uh, there are half inch versions of these available that we can provide for you. But so often we have customers use step down hoses, 3 8 5 16 quarter inch, and they still want to put these nozzles on there. It's nice to only make, say, one step down to a quarter inch or directly be able to put these right on the 3 8 hose rather than uh, having to use another adapter. So um, and it keeps this nice little flexible leader on there as well. So this is also a little bit of a sacrificial lamb, especially when you run the Warthog. It's blasting back a lot of debris against the hose. It'll beat up on this replaceable leader hose rather than the end of your jetting hose. So next, let's go ahead and go into a line and you can watch the controls in action. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get set up for jetting that line. Now, I'm gonna use another tool that comes with all of our jetters. This is called a nozzle extension. What this is for is, I go ahead and put my nozzle on the end of it, and then I tighten it on to the end of the hose. And this is called an anti-turnaround tool. I've basically made this whole thing so long that if I go into an eight inch, it won't accidentally turn around and flip and come back at me. That's a very important safety thing. So if you're going to larger lines, highly recommend you put this on. If, you know, if I'm in a six inch or smaller, I really don't need it. I can just put my nozzle right on the end of the, the hose. But for sake of what I'm gonna do right now, I'm gonna go ahead and put the nozzle extension on. And now I've got an anti-turnaround device in there. It also helps hold the nozzle true into the bottom of the pipe, which is the job of the cleaning that I'll be doing over there. Okay, let's do some live jetting here. We're gonna start in manual mode, which if you're running without the wireless remote. So first thing I do is make sure this red handle valve is down. That's the safety position. Next thing, I, if I have remote control, I make sure this is off. Now I'm free to use the key start. Put the key in, I turn it to the run position for a moment. Let the fuel injector load, let the wireless control valve, if you have wireless, reset and then I get jetting. So I'm gonna stop talking and go after it.
Now, for those of you that purchased wireless remote control, I know we covered that moments ago, but just want to remind you of a few things. Number one, you don't need the key, so we just take the key out when you're going to run wirelessly. Turn your wireless remote switch to on. And don't forget that you need to lift this valve up into the pressure position. This, again, we call the safety, so we leave it down. But as soon as I turn my wireless on, um, the secondary valve, which is just like this one, but it's controlled via an actuator and the wireless remote is open. So it's already in the safety position. So before I go indoors, and most of the reason for wireless remote is because you want to work somewhere away from the jitter, you've got to lift this valve all the way up so that water will flow to the hose and the reel and the nozzle. Okay, let's take a moment talking about hose management and safety. Um, jetting hose is made to be lightweight. It does not have a steel braid in it. It has either polyester or like this jet hose, Kevlar. Um, so being that it's lightweight and with these fiber reinforcements, they have one thing is they're very easy to kink. Okay, so we'd like to talk about hose management. Um, here, I'm ready to wind up my hose after jetting. So I've rolled it out into a nice big loop. Uh, what I don't want to have happen is I'm looking at the hose reel and my controls and I'm winding up and I don't realize that I've created a loop so that when I tighten the hose up, it suddenly kinks. If I put a kink in this, it's going to create a weak point. Okay. So we have other videos too, videos too that talk about like a tiger tail hose guide, using hose guides to protect the jack end of the hose. I'm not going to get into that now. I recommend you take a look at that link. But what I want to just show you here is how I like to wind up the hose so that I don't kink it. I look out for things like I don't want to get caught on a sharp edge somewhere. I don't want to get wrapped around a rock or a tree or a post or something. I've got the hose free to wind up in one nice big long loop. So now I can just come up here. I've got a motorized reel and I put wind. Put it, this one's adjustable. I'm going to put it in kind of a medium slow position and just start winding it up. I'm looking at both getting it on to the reel without you know rolling over the side and I'm looking at my hose around me to make sure it doesn't kink. I can speed it up with my adjustable speed control if I want. Getting near the end. And one thing I didn't cover earlier that I should have, really highly recommend that a few feet in, you put a tape mark here with some electrical tape. Um, you can go crazy with that too. Some guys will roll the whole hose out and they'll put like a piece of red tape at 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet, and they'll put a piece of blue tape at 25 feet, 75 feet, and so on. They might get another color and put them at 100 feet. You can do whatever you want. If you're going to do that kind of stuff, recommend you do it before you get it covered with grease. Okay. Uh, sometimes guys also for safety will maybe spray paint the whole first 10 feet of it orange or something. The point is so that you don't pull the last thing you want to do. The most important safety thing with jetting is you don't accidentally pull the nozzle out under pressure. So that orange color or the red safety tape gives you a warning that you're getting close to the end. But I can tell you from experience that if you pull out a nozzle out of a line under pressure, it doesn't just spray. What it wants to do is fly around everywhere and I have literally been hit right here. If I would have been hit up here, I probably would have a glass eye. Okay, um, These things can hurt you when they get out of the line. The beauty of jetting nozzles is that they have the bias of wanting to pull themselves into the line. So as long as you don't accidentally pull it out under pressure, you know, then you're going to be safe. Um, there are jetting nozzles on the market that have all the jets going forward. You have to be an experienced operator to really understand how to use those because they, they are unsafe. We generally don't sell them. We certainly don't provide them as standard equipment because a nozzle that has no rear jets will want to blast itself right back out of the pipe. Okay. So just lastly, again, talking about safety, put a good mark on your hose somewhere so you know that you're getting close to the end of it so this thing never comes out and bites you. Okay, included with any Brute Jetter and with our Eagle Trailer Jetters is what we call our accessory adapter. So what this is, is this adapts to the end of your jetting hose so you can connect on accessories such as a mini hose which is super super common for those of you that do indoor jetting now this does not require teflon tape simply use a double wrench and give it a good snug 
Now you've got a water tight connection there, just like if you use that nozzle extension that I mentioned earlier. And now we have a simple quick coupler. We can connect into a mini hose. We could have a ball valve control here. We could put in a foot valve control. Our foot valves are gonna have the same quick couplers. We could go into, this is a typical pressure washer connection. So we can connect onto a pressure washer trigger gun or like with our setups, you could use this as a control for your mini hose. The point is they're all with nice quick couplers. These you can find anywhere locally to replace them if you're in a pinch. I uh, just want to make sure when you connect them that you can't see the ball bearings. If you see the ball bearings, it's going to blow off. So you push it till it clicks. So pretty simple and when you want to go back to regular jetting and you want to put a nozzle on here, just again, just take your wrenches and take it right off, put it back in the toolbox. Or you could just leave it connected, leave this little adapter connected to your favorite tool. Well, that pretty much sums up our basic brute training session. Now, um, there's a lot more information you can find online. Really encourage you, if you haven't yet, look at our YouTube site where you can get into more of the technical aspects of nozzles, how the machine actually builds pressure. Highly encourage you to watch those, uh, especially the resistance makes pressure series of two jetters. It'll just help your jetter expertise grow and grow. And to use any of those videos to train new people, train your staff, just so you can get the most out of your brute jetter. Also, for other nozzles and accessories, if you're thinking about, take a look at our site, shop.jettersnorthwest.com, and you have quite a bit there to select from. And of course, anytime, you can give us a call here, we can help you out. Appreciate your time, appreciate your purchase. Get out there, get jetting.